Well, we're here again, all three of us this time. <laughs> hey. I know, a novel concept again. Wow. Breaking records. <laughs> yeah. Two in a row. I hope we can keep up this trend there, right. Shoreline. Maybe. Uh, Maybe. <laughs> New, New Year's oh. is coming, so my weekends are starting to kind of do crazy things. I mean, isn't yep. that wild that we're just, what, three weeks or so away from New Year's? Like, where the hell did this year go? Seriously, though. Um, mine for a while was going straight to my bank account. So that didn't suck. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, that's always a good problem to have. I think for mine, the spring went pretty slow. Uh, summer went quick. And then August hit August and in, into like half of September kind of drug on. But then after that time, it's, it's uh, here we are at the end of the year. Yeah. I had a, a similar thing where like the first half of the year was really slow just cause no shows meant, very little work and uh then after june it's just been gangbusters man i mean that's always a good problem really especially for your industry like hey people there's actually concerts there's shows there's live events there's people willing to do stuff (laughs) outside and everybody remember tip your bartenders yes please do that's right so so there's shoreline so have you seen i mean obviously since you've been been pretty busy um things are opening up more concerts are being happening i know we're still i don't know if we're in a pandemic for not in a pandemic i'm kind of sick of it at this point but but it seems like things are opening up at least where you're at uh yeah we're definitely on the opening up side of things we're a little more conservative uh in my state um it's nice to see that things are starting to happen uh, in more, more of an abundance. Uh, it's been in my industry. It's kind of crazy because a lot of techs have left the industry or left the state or, or whatever, you know, they had to, they had to find different ways to make, you know, an, an income because mm-hmm. live events weren't happening for a long time. And a lot of people in my industry are subcontractors. So they don't, uh, you know, they don't work off of a W2. So they, they are their employer. So there's a lot of that, but, um, now I I would say we're definitely still in a pandemic. There's, I mean, I, I think we're going to be in a pandemic as long as we are afraid of what is happening right now. Um, I'm not saying there's no reason to be afraid of what's happening right now. I'm not saying there is a reason to be afraid of what's happening right now, just with like all the variants and all the, all the unknowns, it's still a really tough time for live events because they're they're definitely a luxury and it's we've shown that we can operate without it. Um, so it'll be once again similar to how it was last time if if things take a turn for the worse, it'll be the first thing cut and the last thing to come back. Yeah. Sure. I like how you now with all these with all these I'm hoping things open up even more though, right? With all these mandates for the vaccine, at least for six and I's industry of aviation, uh, I think most, I know nationwide it was anybody over a hundred employees, but especially for, well, uh, you know, feds and federal contractors, uh, it's, it was mandatory by last Wednesday, I believe. Yeah. yeah no, you were, right. So it was it the same for your industry. I mean, uh, it's kind of an unspoken thing, at least in, in my area. I know a lot of venues and stuff that, have really been fighting the mandates. Um, I, I know people that have been on tour that their band took a stand that they were going to ask that all the people that attend their shows are vaccinated and those venues pulled out and canceled their show for them. Um, and that's just, it's, it's unfortunate. I, it's unfortunate that this becomes such a political thing. Uh, you know, when we have mass sure. gatherings like that, especially in, in my industry and I wish people understood that like, it's not, it's not about you. It's about the person next to you and trying to keep everybody safe. And, you know, uh, live events. One of the reasons I, I, I love working and I love my job is, and this is really what got me into it is you are sitting there and you could be black, white, Democrat, Republican. You can be whatever, and you're attending this event and 
be two completely different walks of life and you're there for the same reasons. And you kind of put all the bullshit aside for a sec and enjoy your time. And I feel like we're starting to see a bit of a divide, even in the entertainment industry um, over something that shouldn't be creating that divide. Right. Right. And I think, I guess what I'm hoping for is just with these, with everybody, you know, getting the shot, making, all right, everybody's got the shot. Now let's, uh, let's go back to normal normalcy for a little bit. Let's say everything open, you know, we can, uh, I mean, I guess for my boring ass life, not much has changed too much, (laughs) right? but, uh, (laughs) but, 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 you know, if we're going to different, uh, enjoying different venues, right? Oh, Hey, I want to go to this concert. Oh, they, they canceled the gig though. Last minute. Why? Damn it. That's I've been looking forward to it. It canceled for the last two years. They were finally going to do it. What happened? I'm hoping that we can get rid of that kind of stuff. You know? Yeah. Um, well, that's, uh, that's tough. Uh, cause a lot of, there's, there's a few different reasons why shows get canceled. Um, they don't do it. They try not to do it very often. Um, primary, the primary reason for canceling shows right now, um, is somebody in the band or touring group, uh, be it the, their sound guy or their lighting guy or whatever. Um, somebody caught COVID. That's generally the reason. Um, yeah. and that, the, and there's just no, I mean, if, if you know, you have COVID, there's no way a venue is going to let you in there and you have to disclose that information. Sure. Cause if not, then it's a, it's a huge liability. Right. Uh, I liked how you mentioned, like, uh, there's a lot of techs who moved on to do other stuff just to maintain money. And I feel that's been the case over the past year, even with aviation and other industries, like, well, the money's not coming in or the work is too slow to have all of you here. So some of them have moved on and transition or try to apply their skills in other places, like say the supply yeah. chain industry or, uh, some, some venue that's way different than what they were normally used to just to get things rolling. Matter of fact, we should actually do an episode about that. I know like a couple of people who are pretty versed in having to do that 180 in their professional life. I mean, I'm sure we have at some point, you know, like just taking on a job or we started a previous job that was nowhere near what we used to do or what we're doing now. Yeah. I almost, uh, I was in the process uh, once stuff was starting to come back right before I was in the process of looking into uh, starting a, a apprenticeship for uh, to be an electrician. Cause I was like, that's not going anywhere anytime soon. And uh, I got to find a way to make money again. Um, and that, that just kind of fell through and luckily things started happening again, but it was a, uh, it was definitely a, a thought. Um, and I was lucky enough to have enough hours as a W2 that I was able to qualify for unemployment and all that. Um, it allowed me to focus on the podcast, which was kind of cool. Um, oh, we, we're definitely appreciative of that one. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, there, there's, there are a lot of people that, like I said, weren't, weren't as lucky and, <clears throat> And it it was definitely a tough year for a lot of people. So, right now, it's, now since we've talked about the podcast or about uh, having the time to do so, we've we try to do this every so often where we reach out to you guys and we take some of your questions and feedback, and then try to answer or voice it here on the show. And we got a lot of stuff actually. So much we actually have to break it up because we just needed we wanted to give enough time to address most of them. Uh, one of the ones that stuck out to me was what was one of the biggest learning curves uh, you had while doing the show? Uh, for me, it was. Uh, so I I did a bunch of studio type stuff and a bunch of uh, recording and stuff like that in my in my time in, in school. And then after school, I have not, haven't touched Pro Tools, haven't done any, any sort of editing in shit. It'd been four years. Um, so I, that was, that was a bit of a, 
a learning curve at first and, and a different kind of editing than what I was used to doing. You know, usually it was music or it was like a 30 second radio, you know, uh, commercial, uh, stuff like that. It was never like an hour and a half long podcast. So there's a lot of different, a, a lot of different, uh, processes that you go through, um, with that. So that, that for me was probably the biggest learning curve. Uh, for myself, I want to say the biggest learning curve was just podcasting in general. Because before Shoreline and and MVP and I got together, they were the only two who knew anything about podcasting. I didn't know dick shit. I thought podcasting was literally like a radio station you caught on your iPod or something. <laughs> I was way off. I like I thought it was like something you just tune into. Like there's an FM channel or something like that. I know, stupid me. And but. Just doing podcasts uh, all together, like what went into it, what you had to do, what kind of stuff you needed, uh, how long should it be, just figuring all that stuff out. And then there are so many hidden steps that a lot of people don't see or understand about podcasting. And especially last year when you, you see this huge boom of people starting stuff and you see them as soon as they start, they just crumble down because they didn't realize just how much went into it and they just weren't able to or willing to commit that much kind of that much time and so like once i finally started seeing that like wow this is a lot of shit (laughs) and it it really tapped into a lot of skills that i didn't know i was capable of having (laughs) so like i mean i was good with time management and whatnot but now we have to manage basically two lives just to keep this thing flowing and we're just like wow man like this is a lot of stuff like um I mean, I'm glad that we're still able to do it and I'm glad that we're able to make things work. But that initial holy shit moment was when we finally realized just what it took to uh, get one going and how to keep it going. Yeah, it's a it's a big time commitment. All right. As the least contributing member of this group, uh, (laughs) what are my what are mine? Uh, Learning how to talk into a mic, I guess. Learning Mm -hmm all the different audio stuff from shoreline. Like that was a struggle recorders, recorders and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like you can't just, you can't just ingest the mic and start talking. Uh, Breathe, breathing was hard. Yeah. It's still hard when you're overweight. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Uh, and then learning how important uh, social media is to really positive continuation, right. And to generating a uh, listener base and, uh, getting out there to the masses. Yeah. I just, for me, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. We record, it gets posted on the interwebs and uh, that's it. But that's not really it. You, you really have to get your name out there. And so, and so people can discover you, right. And then tell their friends and tell their friends. And so I'm, uh, I'm not much of a social media person. I use it for ma- mostly memes that I send to six. Um, and then, that's about it. Um, so, so my, uh, my wife was a big proponent in, in putting us out there and she, she would just tag all these random aviation related pages and whatever else and, and interject into conversations on those pages. Um, but it, you know, it helps. It all helps. It's just stuff that I don't really think about, I guess. I don't think how, how important social media is to that aspect. Right. I think that was for all of us really. Cause majority of us, especially in our generation time frame, we don't do social media that great. I mean, I did MySpace a couple of years ago and that was like the, the coolest thing I did. <laughs> and a couple of years ago, you mean like 20? <laughs> fuck. Yeah. Right. Huh? It really was 20 it's years ago. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while. Tom is still my friend. Shut up. <laughs> He's my only friend. He's on my top eight. <laughs> Holy shit. Top eight. He is your top eight. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> I kind of missed the top eight. You remember songs in that time frame when they were talking about the MySpace top eight? Oh man, yeah. there was so much that MySpace like just frontier frontiered on the on the fucking social media aspect. It, it was so fun, right? Or even like the my the MySpace uh, instant messaging. Oh man, that was ahead of oh, its yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> Wild. But, but yeah, but with social media, especially like there is so much stuff that we just didn't know about, like what social media was capable of. Like you can tag, uh, 
products. You can tag videos. You could do live shit. I'm like, well, where was, how do you do any of this really? And, well, then, and then on top of that, it was, you know, also learning Patreon and that's a whole other, oh yeah, you know, thing where it's like people pay money to help support the podcast. And then, you know, there are so many different things you can do for them, uh, you know, different tiers and whatnot. And I remember that was like a, a two week process of us just like, what do we want this tier to get? And what do we want this tier to get? And what's, why should people pay 25 bucks a month, you know, or why should people pay $7 a month or whatever it was, you know, and it, we started working with that. And then it was, well, what about this, this discord thing? And I'd, I'd been on it because of, of gaming and stuff, but I was like, that's kind of a cool idea. Let's try this. And that's been a whole thing in itself. Like it's, it's, it's a lot. It is. I had never heard of discord until you had mentioned it. Right. I mean, that's, that didn't know what it was to know what, what it did. Um, I've learned a lot, like in a lot of the, uh, interwebs and technical side of this podcast, again, as the least contributing member, I, I have learned a lot from that aspect because for most of you out there, um, who are listening, uh, the only thing I really contribute is a voice and that's about it. <laughs> and that's more <laughs> being than enough. honest. That's, that's being the best honest. one. That's the best one. That's I mean, what, you uh, do have easily the best voice out of all of us, so it's fine. Agreed. Well, I agree on that. I appreciate that. I guess I can, uh, I can be Duke silver. You ever <laughs> seen parks and Rick <laughs> smooth jazz radio. <laughs> you know, you say it best yourself. You have, you have, you have the, the face for radio. Yes. That's right. I got a face for radio. If oh, anything. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that kind of, that kind of goes into this other question. Like what is some of the best advice for you can give to someone who wants to start a podcast? Well, as we kind of just said, you got to get good with the social medias and the technology of things. Um, you definitely got to commit some time to this. But in my opinion, the most important thing you need to do when you're starting a podcast is know what your message is going to be, right? Because you can, you can bounce around and say all kinds of topics and stuff, but if it doesn't um, contribute to your central message, you're going to forget why you even started the thing. And you're just going to crumble with probably like within 10 episodes or whatever, however long it takes for you to just say, you know what? This shit ain't fun anymore. Well, that's a good point because there's so many other podcasts out there that are just, there's no uh, real main topic of discussion. It's just kind of, it's all over the place. It's random. It varies from episode to episode. And like I said, there's so many of that. So how do you set yourself apart is you got, you got to come up with your own, your own, uh, brand so to speak i guess if that's the right word i don't know if that's the right word but yeah i think kind of like your own identity and you know i think one of the things that i was thankful that that six was definitely tracking on is uh logos and stuff like that you know and and there are some some places to to do relatively cheap ones and and e i forget who six found but they did a really good job and, and he kind of sent them ideas and this is kind of what we want. And they shot back a bunch of different logos and that's how we have our logo now. Um, but like Fiverr would be a great opportunity for a place to get a, a good logo for cheap. Um, and, and just branding branding is, is a lot of, a lot of that. But even if you aren't getting to that point yet, I'd say probably my biggest uh, and this is going to sound stupid, but I think probably the, the, the biggest piece of advice I can give to somebody that just wants to start is just do it. I mean, have, have ideas of things that you want to talk about, but just start sitting down and recording conversations, whether it's, you know, topics that you want to talk about and it's just you, uh, take your phone and start recording some stuff and you're, 80% there, you know, um, then it's just learning different little editing tools and stuff like that. But yeah, um, my I, advice is going to be find yourself a six and a shoreline. But what do <laughs> I mean by that? Right. Find people who are, who are just as interested. If, if you want to go the team route, right. Find yourself a group of friends who are just as interested in it as you. And then you all just kind of collaborate and work together and it just kind of becomes something. Totally. That point. Mm hmm. 
I should matter, but like what Shoreline said, like just do it. Like that's more or less how we went about that's it. Like, what it was, yeah, that's <laughs> what it really started for us, right? It, it started out at first. It was just like a vent for all three of us. Like we just had like the, we were saying, "Man, work today sucked here." Like, "Man, me too," and then "Man, me too," and then all of a sudden, like, "Wow, there's a lot of shit in common about this." And then uh, more technicians from our line of work just started uh, dumping their their weights on us like just saying like hey this is what i'm going through this is what i've been through this is what works making me do etc and some of the conversations were just freaking wild and we're we just looked at each other one day like we should probably do something we should probably record this or write this down something because this is pretty insane like how common some of this shit is and just how uh relatable this stuff can be and then most of all just some of the shenanigans that we talk about really and uh, we just we just went on a lamb and said, let's just fuck, let's fuck it. Let's just do it. We'll figure it out as we go along. And here we are today. Totally. Um, so, yeah, I, I think ultimately just do it. And every, every I mean, podcasts have you can listen to five different podcasts and it, it'll sound five different ways. So don't be don't get too hung up on how it sounds, uh, especially when you're first starting out. Oh yes. Don't don't <laughs> I think I was guilty of that, right? Because I, I, I've been listening to podcasts for a number of years. And so when we started doing this, I was like, oh well, to be successful, I have to model myself like this person over here, right? Because they're successful or whatever else. But that's not really that that's what works for them. It doesn't really work for you, right? Right. And you know, the other side of that is uh it, make sure you're gonna stick with it before you start investing real money. Um, cause, cause gear's not cheap. Um, and you like, we, we, I think we spent a collective of probably about two, two and a half thousand dollars, um, just to get us up and going kind of to where we're at right now, not including any computers that we have and software and all that stuff. That's a whole other spiel, but also don't be intimidated by that, you know, and, and if you get into it and you really start doing it, then look at it as, look at it as a hobby and like a kind of a release. And I think that, that you'll find that you really like it. And if, if anybody specifically has questions about podcasting or audio equipment or what should I, what should I have to, to get it started? Like just, just hit us up and, and uh, we, we will get back to you and, and we'll let you know. Yep. Most deaf. At, wor- at, at worst case scenario, the, it'll be a good daily, weekly therapy session for you. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's which is bad. which is you know mental health is worth its weight in gold anyhow. Yes. Totally. Yes. I think that's the one thing 2019, 2020 really taught me was like your your quality of life means more than your paycheck in some in most cases. Most cases. Absolutely. So, okay, let's move on to the next question. What is the most dependable tool you have used? Ooh, uh, let's see. We're talking approved tools. Okay. Oh, uh, <laughs> if they're approved or they don't really care that you have it, I would say mine would be like the go-to Leatherman or a Gerber. Um, because I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> hey, look at that. Commonality again. <laughs> Reason why? Because, I mean, it's, it's basically like a Swiss Army knife for tools you got your pliers you got your cutters you got your knives you got your little uh makeshift screwdriver and whatnot and for most cases that don't require any type of special um tooling to get into things you can 99 percent of the time be handled by a gerber or a leatherman or uh whatever the the new hip uh multi-tool is hmm for me on this one i'm gonna go forward wrench Ooh. So you got adjustable, an adjustable set of pliers. You've got a hammer. You've got an axle nut. You've got fuel line. So for a lot of people who work on the road, like I, I have and, and stuff in the past, you have to try to maximize your versatility out of your travel toolbox, right? And for me, the Ford wrench was the most versatile tool I could do really anything on the aircraft and i could use that i could use that it was a pry bar it was a like i said a hammer axle nut fuel lines you name it did did a lot of stuff with that even had one at one point i modified uh the teeth on it 
and uh, made a set of channel locks almost. <laughs> Stop. That yeah, works. That's point. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I mean, if it's yours, then who cares, right? That's right. And no. it was mine. Now, if it wasn't, then, mm, I mean, ask for forgiveness after you've done it? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, see, I had to I had to modify the tool boss just to uh, just to uh, get the job done. But we got paid, though, right? Hey, <laughs> there we go. Great. I, I promise there's nothing inside the aircraft or somewhere where it shouldn't be. I modified this outside, so it's not considered lost on aircraft. So that's that plus. <laughs> oh, shit. yeah, I <laughs> think that would be probably. I mean, yeah, obviously, you're not cutting things with it or whatever else, but. Just right off the top of my head at first thought, yeah, the the forward wrench I had was the uh, most versatile. I could use it for a slew of things to get no matter really what job on the aircraft done. Right. Uh, let's see. Next question. Uh, what are some cultural norms in your industry that don't translate well in other parts of your life? <laughs> oh, besides the anger and rage? Hmm. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to think about that one for a minute. Uh, well, due to the nature of my, uh, my job being in entertainment and live events and dealing with tours, probably the partying, uh, does not translate well. Uh, it can't be a party all the time, but in my industry, when work can sometimes turn into a giant party. Uh, you just got to kind of watch yourself. Mm-hmm. I, w- I would say as mine, along with the coffee and anger is the, like the cussing. Cause er- er- if you've worked anywhere on a line where there's a lot of people and there's a lot of bustle and hustle, there's going to be a fuckload of cussing a lot. <laughs> and for some individuals, especially certain listeners, they don't translate that well, or they don't, they don't, um, perceive that well like i'm sorry but that's just how it was when we were on the in, on the line that's how it was when we were in the office i mean if i'm in front of a customer I've, of course i'm not gonna cuss in front of them right there's time and place for everything but i've i've caught myself doing this a lot especially when now the i got kids like like hovering and orbiting around me is just how much i say certain cuss words in a single sentence yep yeah, you don't even realize it totally. until you've said it, and you're like, "Oh, I shouldn't have said that to that to my kid." <laughs> and, and, and like Six says, it, right? The the cursing is uh, it comes across as abrasive to a lot of people. Typically, prior military, no, it's it's you know it's your more or less your office workers who they hear you talking like, "Oh my gosh, that guy is what a terrible person." It could be the nicest person in the world. They're just judging you off of how you talk. But you know what was that from Trailer Park Boys? Look, I can't, I can't talk without cursing. <laughs> um, <laughs> totally. Rick, was that Ricky, right? Ricky from that show? Anyways. Yeah, so I, and what's funny is I just went through HR training the other day where you had to do what you'll stop doing, what you'll start doing, and what you'll continue doing. And in front of our HR rep, I, I had to state that I would stop using such coarse language. Um. So I didn't say I'd stop cursing, but I would stop using coarse language. So I just got to stop talking with a gravelly voice. <laughs> there you go. There you go. No, but, I thought you were. Uh, I thought you were quitting the the the, the cursing ways, and that's why I called you. A so quitter. what I'm trying to say is, uh, instead of saying what the what the fuck now, I go what the French, you know. <laughs> there you go. Or French this, you know, or whatever. I'm or, trying to get better about it. Well, what um, co- what commercial was that where they were? They were gonna cuss, or they they express themselves like they're cussing, but it's like totally like PG words. Like, oh god, oh, who are you calling a cootie queen? You lit liquor, <laughs> right? Or like, shut the front door, but they'll say like, shut the fuck up, like shut the front door, or yeah. something like that. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. It was, I think that was like a progressive commercial or some. I think shit. it was yeah. too. I think you're right, Shoreline. Yeah, it was either that or like a paper towel commercial. No, or something like that. it was uh, Orbits. It was the it was the fucking gum commercial. Uh, because it was the clean, clean your mouth up. Clean your mouth up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Who are you? What are you doing with this cootie queen? Who are you calling a cootie queen? You lint liquor. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Uh, we should try uh, doing uh, that classic. for an episode. Like, uh, just like 
a parody episode like where we instead of cussing we just say like the most lame out of control like in 1950s like like censor I'm, words <laughs> i mean we could try to do that right do a whole episode right, it just put the uh, uh a caveat at the beginning hey we're going to try not to curse this episode keyword try so we'll probably get on some hot subject and we'll be like and this piece of sand dollar uh you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would, that would be a tough one and vice versa uh, we should do one tough. where we should do an episode where it's completely clean but just put bleep words or bleep sounds every so often like wow these guys oh, are really at man. it <laughs> you just added hours on my editing <laughs> <laughs> but man think of the outcome and oh, then yeah. i said beep <laughs> that, that situation didn't really call for that cursing but all right then i guess you know <laughs> my favorite my, um, one of my favorite things is unnecessary censorship anybody that's out listening right now um don't pause this and walk away because we want you to come back um but definitely go look up after this, look up unnecessary censorship. It's, it's fucking hilarious. That is pretty hilarious. I remember you showed us like three uh, videos yeah. of it. We're just dying. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the question then, which was what doesn't translate? I think standards for me, uh, within aviation, we work to such tight tolerances and highest standards as set forth by federal regulations or whatever else that, you you operate in that environment all day and then you go out into the regular world and you go to the auto mechanic and their standards aren't as high or you're having work done on your home and the standards aren't as high and they don't clean up afterwards and you're watching them do the work and you're like, just all you need to do is clean that one thing up or no, you need to, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's the standards, the standard side of it for me is I expect everybody to, to work to the same and that's, it's just unrealistic, but. Um, even within my own home, right? You know, I'll watch the kids do something like, nope, you should do it, but no, in, inside color inside the lines. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're just little kids, but it's, a, it's the standards, right? Yep. Um, hey, you you kind of touched on it, but I kind of want to ask you guys, have you ever caught yourself doing work stuff on like, like you, you think of things like, like, Oh, I need to tighten it this way, or I need to put, put it, install it this way on non-work related things. Like, me, for instance, I'll safety wire stuff on my car that don't fucking need it. <laughs> yeah, or, I've done that. I'm like, uh, this could loosen up. So I'm just going to go ahead and put this down here. Um, or, I'll, or I'll find myself in the engine bay routing cables a certain way. So it looks cleaner and neater and easier to troubleshoot if I run into issues down the road. Mm-hmm. I'll do that. Yep. Right. I do that all the time. Or, or like uh, you see like a whole fuckload of cables and they're just like like a hot noodle mess and like, yeah, we're going to uninstall all this and route it the right way. And it has to be a certain path. Like you said, like red has to follow red. You have to cable tie it every so many inches and shit. <laughs> oh man. I do that to my yeah. desk. It feels like every other month, I'm just like, uh, well maybe I want to try it this way. Maybe I want to try it this way. And then I'll just reroute all the cables for it. Right. Or like you so, said, like, Oh, I didn't give myself enough slack. So I need to like redo the whole thing and give me like at least two reworks. <laughs> exactly. So I, I did that in my garage, right? I closed, off, I had exposed studs inside the garage and I closed them off this past summer. But before I closed them off, there's cabling and stuff, you know, wiring for the, for the home that's run through there. And I went through and reorganized the wiring and made it in straight lines and nice and neat and separated them out. This goes to this, this goes to that instead of one giant bundle. Um, and then I took notes of where those were located. And then I have a piece of, I have a piece of paper taped to my freezer in the garage that's got the locations under the studs of where these cables are run through in case I run into issues. I know where to cut and find all that kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> just hey, made my own blueprints and stuff. <laughs> hey, but you know, like you said with the standard, some of that stuff, like you're so, it's so ingrained in you that you, it's near impossible to turn it off. And that's kind of the same way. Like when I see uh, like cotter keys, like just random cotter keys, like for like any other stuff, like, for stuff for cranes or lifts or even on the cotter keys in your car brakes. I look at it and I'm freaking just bugging out. I'm like, Oh my God, this is fucking terrible. <laughs> you know, I just, I just did that the other day on a piece of age equipment. I was like, that cotter key was put in there. So stupid. And they didn't even cut it. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for anybody that is, is uh, a fan of anybody's having a really tough cable day. Uh, 
just go look at the subreddit r slash cable porn and oh. uh, it, it is oh, so awesome. satisfying yeah those are good and it will make it'll make your day better i promise i think i saw one like that where this guy had a his all his game systems i think he had like three or four game systems on his wall like one of those uh floating shelf mounts or whatnot and yeah. he he routed his cables in such a way to look like a circuit board. I was like, wow. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I saw and that he put too. like LED lights behind him, right? So they pulse lights as they follow each of the cables or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, freaking that's pretty dope. cool. But that, that's that level of meticulousness that we all have in our heads. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've been guilty of this too, is sometimes I'll, I'll get to the point where like, and just to kind of expand on the question, have you ever gotten to the point where you like you do that all day for work and you just get to the point where you're just like, I just don't, I just don't fucking care right now. You know, when you get home. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Big time. Like you're like, Oh, you don't work. I mean, I, I do the base work on my vehicles and stuff like that, but for like heavy maintenance or whatever in the vehicles, people are like, Oh yeah, I'm going to rip out the transmission this weekend and replace this and this and that. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to take mine to a shop to get that done. Like, Totally. But you're a mechanic, do it yourself. I'm like, you work on shit all week. I don't want to do it at home now, you know? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> That's a pretty yeah, good point. I, I suffer from that quite a bit. <laughs> more than I'd like to care to admit. Right. Which I guess I just did. <laughs> Meh, you know. So go, going on with <laughs> going on right with the maintenance that you guys don't want to do is cross threading just free Loctite. <laughs> uh, it's it's a free ass kicking from the next guy. <laughs> That's Fair what enough. it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Like, especially if you're in a in a working an operation where you have certain uh locations that your aircraft rotate between and that plane is going to show up at one of the other locations uh uh at some point and somebody's going to go do that maintenance again the, ho- the hope is that it comes back to you and you get to unfrench what you've what you've done but uh it's going to go to somebody else's location and you're going to get a real angry call Yep, real fast. <laughs> right. Now, th- this kind of flashes me back to like like the air management system on some older aircraft, like we're talking like 80s, 70s, 60s uh, aircraft, where everything was all just screws and not those um, quick uh, quick release fasteners. Yeah, like, Zeus fasteners. Yeah, like Zeus fasteners or Alcoa fasteners. It's like straight up just screws. And whenever you go to take these off, there's always going to be a bunch, at least like a solid row where they just strip out or they're cross threaded. So like you got to like take your, like, take the extra time to drill it out or to uh, get the extractor set and pull it out, whatever the case may be. So whatever your job was that supposedly only supposed to take like 30 or 40 minutes. Now it's like two fucking hours later and you're still trying to untap all these stripped out or cross threaded uh, fasteners. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> that seems like a weekly occurrence uh, where I'm at now. Oh, walking through the hangar all you hear is son of a beanbag and <laughs> and you're like well what's going on you walk over and they're like oh six of these things stripped out or the nut plates broke off ah right you know? oh i hate those or the or the best ones right is when they cross started out but they broke the heads so they just try to put some like uh rtv or um what the hell um Fill the hole in. Yeah, oh, just fill the hole in and make it look like a screw head. I like, saw B half or whatever. Yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> god. Oh my god. Yeah, I've but you seen can, that before. But you can tell they really took the time to cover it up because they made that cross or whatever the top of the fastener to look exactly like the other ones. Like, I mean, if you're gonna take the time to cover it up, you might as well just have fixed it. But well, whatever. so the ones that I've seen, right, is that um, it's not an exposed head, so the head's under other material so you take off you know you take off the panel once you put the panel back on oh, i broke this off cool let me fill in the hole but it gets covered up with you know a primer a paint and some other material and then you don't find it until the next time that panel comes off and that might be depending on what's under there that might be that might be next month that might be in six more years you don't know you right know I mean? mm-hmm. depending on what breaks, uh, so, so it's pretty fun mm-hmm yeah. So here's a another question. I say this will probably be a big um loaded question is uh what's the difference between contracting and a direct hire job? Ooh. Like I said loaded. Well, uh so first I'll say 
pay. Typically, as a contractor, you make more money on the hour, but that's mm-hmm. because the company is not paying into your benefits, i.e. a 401k, medical, or whatever else, so you can get more money the hour. But conversely, like I just said, as a direct hire, you're, you get a retirement plan, typically uh, medical benefits, and then whatever what other whatever other amenities that company might have, such as student, uh, student aid, um, other various programs, and I'm running short on my head. So as a contractor, you would not have access to those. Yeah, that's right. certainly, uh, certainly all true. Um, I, a big learning curve for me was, uh, having to keep track of all of my mileage and my, uh, receipts and expenditures and, and all of that, um, shout out QuickBooks self-employed. Uh, if any of you are in a contracting environment, you can invoice through it. You can keep track of your mileage. You can do all of that, uh, through the app. But, uh, anyways, that, uh, that was a big thing learning what you can and cannot write off. And, um, you know, understanding that like unemployment doesn't take care of contractors. So like if for whatever reason you are out of work, like you have to hustle for you. Yep. Yeah. So the stability side of it, right. That's another aspect. Typically as a direct hire, you have uh, a little more stability. So let's say you're in a corporation where there's numerous programs within it or different they they cover different shows across different resorts, casinos, wherever, you know, Shoreline has spoken about in the past that he works. But um, let's say, like for the aviation side, right? Let's say my program, uh, the funding's run out. The customer no longer wants or needs that that uh, particular asset, so they mothball it. Well, as a contractor, you're now out of work. The, the corporation's going to go, cool, get out. We don't need you anymore, and we're going to stop paying you. But as a direct hire, they might go, okay, let's try to retain this person and find another location, another spot for them. So at least you'll have work. Yeah, it might not be the area you want to be in, but you still, you're still working. Right. <clears throat> I'll also say, uh, in this, as far as pay is concerned, with contracting your appropriate, a certain fund type, right? Like, uh, oh, this is coming out of such and such fund, or this is coming out of such and such account, etc. And there's usually like a fixed cap for how much you're allowed to get. And when that runs out, like, oh, okay, your contract's over. Versus like, say, if you're a direct hire or even a Fed, this is all appropriated through certain government regulations and stuff like that. So we have to give you this stuff, right? Versus like a contract, we can just renegotiate and say, okay, well, we're not paying you this because you've only executed or you only perform to this. So uh, as far as contract is, is concerned, your, your pay and your benefits, if there's any, uh, really uh, depend on what your effectiveness is as a whole and what the customer or whoever is using your contract feels that we, they should give you. So, and that, and this is kind of like with the federal employment system as well. Like there's contractors, then there's um, like um, actual a specialist that's hired by an agency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's different fund levels that go into it as to what we're allowed to pay you and how we factor in how much to pay you. And this goes by locality and all this other shit too, but that's a whole lot of financial game. I'm just not well-versed in, but like what uh, MVP and Sherling were saying is uh, when you're contracting, you're going to, you're going to get more uh, in your wallet but there's a whole lot of protections and a whole lot of securities and benefits that you're just being foregoed because you technically don't belong to the company. Yeah. I mean, you're going to make more in the hour, but your stability, long-term st- stability is typically not there. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I do have a question actually for you too. I don't know if this is something that's a little more unique to my industry or not on the topic of contracting, but do you guys uh, find that, if you find a good contractor that your company tries to go out and actually directly hire those people instead of contracting yep. them. Oh yes, exactly. We've yeah. had uh, several people and programs that I've worked that came in. We're just stellar, stellar people. And you say, well, how did you get into contracting? Well, just kind of like we talked earlier in the episode, right? They worked somewhere hard times hit, they lost their jobs. So they go to like a, uh, what's that uh, big aviation uh, company six where they, they contract out. It's called uh, 
Ooh, uh, it's slipping my head right now, but I know yeah, what you're talking too. about. Anyways, so so we gotta keep gotta keep the lights on, right? Gotta keep working, gotta keep moving. So they go and say, okay, you know, uh, sign me up as a contractor and and ship me out to wherever to to get a job. So you know, they didn't lose their job because they were a terrible employee. They just bad times, you know. Yeah, hard times hit. Uh, so they'll come over and they'll just kick ass and do whatever. And typically, the the management program management for whatever will go. Uh, why don't they work for us? Let's offer it to them. And so. They do, and they accept, and then there you go. You got a new employee. Totally, yeah. That's that's something that I just I just experienced recently. Um, I was contracting for this company that I, I now am a W two for. So I was just curious nice. if that was something that was a little more unique to my industry or not. But it doesn't sound like it, which is cool. Yeah, and some companies too, though, use the contracting as, uh, aspect of it, kind of like a recruiting tool. Like um, we like especially certain companies, they only have a finite amount of spaces they're allowed to give, but contracting, they're like, they're like a revolving door. They come and go uh, every so many cycles. So they say like, well, if you want to come in to air quote, get the experience, you would, we recommend you go to this contracting uh, a company right here, get the experience. Cause you're still technically working with us. And then once the cycle goes through and we have an appropriation for another position, now we have someone who we want and it's proven that they do the work right. And just move them right on in. And that's a trend for a lot of agencies, a lot of companies where like, we want you, we just don't have the space for you, but we also want to see how good you're working actually. So we'll say, go to this contracting firm, get the experience. You're still technically working with us. And then we'll just move you in as soon as a spot opens up. Yep. Now, one of the positive sides of contracting, right? Is um, if you're, if you're one of those where you're, you know, you get bored easier. You just like to kind of bounce around and travel a little bit and do whatever. Contracting is a great option, especially if you're, uh, especially if you're one of those that has another source of income or, and, um, you know, let's say retired military, right? You have, um, you have your retirement check, but you also have your, uh, medical benefits through the VA and whatever else. So, you know, finding a corporation that provides all that isn't top of your priority because you have that as a, you have that anyways. So uh, contracting gives you an opportunity to go work a variety of programs and platforms and, and just uh, get your experience up there, but also just something new kind of uh, all the time. Right. Yeah. And kind of to expand on that too. Um, another, another difference is uh, you get to make your own schedule generally. Um, mm hmm unless it's like tied to it tied into a contract that you sign or whatever, that's different, but um, you get to make your own schedule. But the flip side of that is, you know, you work when you want to and you don't work when you don't. The difference is, is like, if you want to take a vacation, there's no PTO for you. There's no, like, you know what I mean? Like it's, you work for you. You get paid when you work. You don't get paid when you don't. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly that. I'm glad you brought that up because that's another thing that a lot of people are jumping into a contracting gig just don't get. Like you, you rate leave if it's in your contract, but not almost a good percent of the time it doesn't, or you have to work so many hours and then the rest of the time it's air quote unpaid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, and then like let's say there's uh, weekend work because there's a uh, the high stress schedule, uh, fast paced tempo going on to meet meet the schedule or whatever else. So oftentimes as a contractor, you will be working the weekends, whereas the full-time employees will be off on the weekends, namely because you're only getting a base rate. You're typically not going to get a warrant and overtime pay. Right. You're right. contractor for the set amount, a dollar amount. And so Monday through Sunday, that it's the same hourly, hourly rate. It doesn't change with OT or whatever else. So they're going to have you come in on the weekends while, uh, direct hires and a lot of typically be have their time off because they would be getting the overtime pay at that point. Yeah. And it all kind of depends on what agreement you have with the company you're sure. working for. Um, some companies, you know, will still allow overtime. Some won't. Um, some and it might even depend on the state too, right? The state in which you're in, what their labor laws and things like that are. Exactly. You know, in like some companies that I I've worked for, they've paid me as if I was a W2 employee they just left the taxes or maybe they paid me 10 to 20% more or, you know, all of these things, um, you know, the taxes would be on me 
but I'm also getting paid more, you know, hourly. And then they bill it so that it's, you know, to their customers so that if it's anything over X amount of hours, you know, it's overtime, you know, be it on a day rate or on a weekly rate, whatever. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, those are all things you have to consider, uh, as differences between, between the two. Right. And I think as a contractor, if you're not from that area or whatever, I believe you, you rate a per diem too. Correct. But again, pending your contract, pending the state you're in, pending a variety of things. Right. Mileage to and from job sites, uh, my, right. uh, meals, uh, while you are working, um, stuff like that, you can write off, um, and keep track of all your receipts, keep track of all of that stuff. Um, yep. Cause, mm-hmm. and you'd be amazed what you, what you can write. Like, and like you can write off your health insurance if you pay for your health insurance um, as a, as a contractor. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's kind of a wild ride. It's different. It's not for everybody, but it's also the best option for some. Definitely. And this is like a layered, this, this is all in layers. We're just barely skimming the surface of this stuff. So there's like so much stuff that goes into it. Yeah, I we mean, could honestly do a whole ass episode on it. We, I mean, I was just about to say that. Like you guys want, if you guys want us to do an episode on this, please let us know. Reach out to us. Tell us. Um, there's going to be a lot of research that's going to be involved in it just because of how intense this stuff is. And we'll, we'll try not to go too deep into the weeds because, you know, a lot of that's ever changing um, issues. But yeah. if, we'll, we'll leave it to you guys if, you guys, if we should do an episode like that because like what Shoreline said, we can go on for a solid hour just on this question alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well with, with that, I, 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 once again, thank everybody for their questions. Uh, we've been, we've been talking about these for the last week or so um, since the bonus episode that we put out on, on Patreon. And uh, I think we're going to be releasing that to you guys too. But anyways, um, yeah, it's it's always fun to get interaction from you guys and and please if you have any questions or feedback on the podcast or just want to say hey, like hit us up. We love hear we love hearing from you guys. Most def. Uh I like to give a shout out to some of the individuals who've kind of been instrumental in helping us with some of these questions. Uh Victoria Pilaro is one. Um uh Cora, the flight deck therapist, is another. Uh the girl the ladies that did talk to McMosas again. I mean, we they always uh, give us some good feedback. Um, there's a whole bunch of you, but the, those three I just wanted to mention out specifically because they were just like bombing us with questions, and I just like had to pick through the uh, the litter as to which ones we can answer right away and which ones like could evolve into their own episode. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's kind of my favorite. I would say is when when uh, listeners hit us up. I like to hear what they have to say. Um, with all the questioning and everything like that. So please continue. Please. We love it. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. And uh, have a great day. Bye everyone. Bye everybody. We'd like to take this time to thank our patrons for supporting our show and allowing us to continue to make episodes, maintain our gear and create merch for all of our listeners with special thanks to Erica Lamont, Chris Hawkins, Ryan Freshour, Dan Schubert, Jenny Dignan, and the ladies of the Dick Talk and Mimosas podcast. Thank you all so much for your support and patronage. Visit our shop at cancelformaintenance.com and grab some swag to show off both your support for us and your prowess as an aircraft technician. If you have ideas for the show or you'd like to be a guest on the show, visit our contact us section and send us a line. We will do what we can to get your ideas or yourself on the show. You can also follow us on social media such as on Facebook, at Cancel for Maintenance, Instagram at Kanks, that's C-A-N-X for Maintenance Podcast, or on Twitter at CXMX Podcast. Check out some of our affiliates like Rockwell Time, where they make both rugged and classy watches to fit your lifestyle. Use the code CX4MX and save 10% off your purchase. Support us on Patreon. Our patrons get exclusive perks such as access to our Discord, discounts and early access to merch special patron only episodes and so much more thank you again so much for listening and we'll see you next time